Welcome back to The Money Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Matt Lusto of Luxor Technologies to talk about their newest firmware product, LuxOS. We talk about reasons for building LuxOS, the functions available on it, and how to onboard to the new firmware. Introducing the newest and most requested course from Foundry Academy, Intro to Hashboard Diagnosis and Repair, offered by the same experts who provided top technical training for mining technicians in the U.S. This Essential Academy course will take place in Rochester, New York from May 1st to the 5th, 2023. With a strong focus on mastering micro soldering basics. Founders dedicated instructors possess years of ASIC hardware experience and will guide you through each step of the process. They'll ensure that you gain the confidence and skills required to undertake basic repair jobs and keep your operation healthy and hashing. Register today at foundryacademy.com. Welcome back to the Mining Pod. We got Matt Lusto from Luxor Technologies. We're going to go and talk about Lux OS, a new mining firmware option out there that they built completely in house. And as the Bitcoin Magazine article will put it, completely built in the United States. Matt, welcome to the show. Hey, Will. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited for this conversation. Uh, Brains OS and Vinesh, maybe a few other ones out there, have been sort of like dominating the marketplace for uh, aftermarket firmware for Bitcoin miners, specifically AMP miners. It's great to see more competition out there. Uh, and of course, Luxor team also just building on top of the technology stack. It's already established. So let's start from the beginning here. Uh, give our listeners who might not be familiar with what these things are, what these firmware options are in the first place, how LuxOS fits into that stack and how you gave, came about to the idea of building it. Yeah. So if you look at the, the technological stack of Bitcoin mining, um, at the base layer, you have the machine, the ASIC, the the miner, right? It's just a computer that has fancy peripherals. Like rather than a printer, you have special chips on a board that allow you to iterate SHA-256 like a billion times per second, right? Like, so with that, with each of these little computers is basically uh, an operating system that is called firmware. Traditionally for the past decade or so, uh, the biggest chunk of the firmware market has come from the stock manufacturers, right? So Bitmain, Watts Miner, they all produce their own firmware um, and they ship the machines with it. Um, at some point in the past, like, I, I don't know exactly when they went to market, but it, S9 is the first that I see out there. So probably five or so years ago, some third party options entered the market where they were basically dropping an SD card into the machine and adding their own firmware. And what that firmware allowed miners to do uh, it was to overclock. That was probably the biggest feature right off the off the bat that they were eager to to leverage. And what overclocking is is you've got a certain clock speed on the the chips. Well, you can make them go faster. However, that consumes more power. So the uh, third party market kind of evolved there. So that's firmware, right? It allows you to do different things with the miner that you wouldn't be able to do traditionally. And that market's been relatively limited to like two or three large players. And so beyond firmware, so we'll zoom out, zoom back out to the full tech stack of, of Bitcoin mining, you've got firmware and then above that, you've got pools. So mining pools are where, uh, where miners sh submit their shares because I, for anyone who's not aware, the, the likelihood of you solving a specific block, not that, not very good, like worse, the worse chances than getting hit by lightning. So, um, well, maybe that's best chance, better chances, but you get the point very unlikely. So what miners do rather than chew up all of that power, they submit it to a mining pool and uh, they get rewarded by being paid in Bitcoin. So basically mining pools are purchasing hash rate, which is a commodity in this, this essence, um, they're purchasing hash rate from uh, miners, individual miners, and they're paying in Bitcoin. So um, there's different payout methods. There's FPPS, which is full pay per share, where we this, that's what Luxor is. Um, it's a more predictable payout method because it's not as dependent upon luck. Now there's the the counterparty risk that you have to have liquidity to be able to fund that because you will go segments without winning a block. However, full paper share, you get paid for the hash rate you contribute. The alternative, the leading alternative is um, PPLNS. It's pay per last in shares to where looking back a certain number of shares, the pool will pay you for the hash rate that you contributed provided they win a block and there's a, a block subsidy. So everything that was in that block, including the mining fees and the subsidy, that gets paid out to the miners in a proportional way. Um, whereas the um, 
FPPS, we pay for the expected value of that block, which we base ours on the last 144 blocks, which is about a day. Um, others do it based on actual 24 hours. It all depends on on uh, what pool and how they're configured. So to really kind of summarize what Luxor's trying to do here with, with this effort is to be a full stack mining software provider. So um, that's one of the reasons we want to enter the market. We, um, we got feedback pretty consistently from some of our larger clients, especially the US-based public companies, um, that they were interested in a firmware solution and that they, they would consider uh, picking it up. Um, one of the big limitations to the players in the market that were out there, Bitman, the, manufa- the, st- the stock manufacturer, didn't provide the flexibility they were interested in, but the other third-party firmware providers are based in Eastern Europe. Um, that's no disrespect to what they provided. Brains, Vanish, they're fantastic products. But there's a, a counterparty risk that publicly traded companies can't necessarily take in the U.S. So um, we found that opportunity, and about 24 months ago, we started building a full full team of embedded engineers. Like these are some of the smartest guys I've worked with, just period. But uh, easily in the in the past decade, so uh, they've put together a really solid product. It looks fantastic. Like if you haven't checked it out, go check out the screenshots on the webpage luxor luxor tech slash firmware. Um, we're really excited to bring it to market. I, I joined about uh, three, four months ago uh, from a very different background, but uh, they brought me in for business development because I had enough of a tech background to to understand it and a, a passion for Bitcoin to to really kind of stick to it. Like we we joke, I accepted the offer when Bitcoin was at like sixteen k. That's how they knew they knew I was going to stick around. Right? That's awesome. Tell me a little bit about the Vinesh and the brains thing here, and for those who are listening, not super familiar with this, like. Brains and Vinesh are like older firmware providers of the space, still highly repeatable. Uh, but you guys are coming to market with a product that's going to compete against them. The geographic thing there is interesting uh, because, yes, both of those teams are based out of Eastern Europe for the most part. Um, that being said, this is like a, a global industry, right? So, like, I would assume that they're pretty like running in the ranks in terms of customer service on that front. Um, what were these public miners giving you feedback on exactly? Like, what were they saying with that counterparty risk? That's interesting. Well, I mean, if, if you look at the context of, of payments, right? Like you just look in the past year and a half, what's going on with sanctions with Russia, like regardless of how compensation is structured, there's, there's going to be a little more, uh, scrutiny paid to any kind of payment that could relate to a Russian organization. Like, again, like that's, uh, just a matter of fact in the regulatory environment we operate. So the risk of, even if there's a, a another third party in between to to kind of try and mitigate with like a u.s presence like that still represents a concern for for any operator right gotcha yeah i i like honestly i don't even thought about that for being a reason um for you guys to develop this or for public miners to even like consider building something like this but it does make sense when you put it like that let's turn it over to the functions that are within the software or just like within firmware in general maybe that's actually the best place to start is like what these firmware providers are offering, whether it be you guys or Brains or Vinesh or someone else, uh, what can it do for an ASIC and how does it help out a, a typical ASIC provider? And then who is typically using this? Is this like the home miner or does it go all the way up to the pub coast? Yeah, so I'll answer that last question first. Um, anyone can use it, right? Like you, you could, if you have the right machine that's supported by ours, any other firmware, um, you can plug it in and it'll it'll operate just fine. Um, the primary functions that it provide are about control, right? So I mentioned clock speed earlier. Um, that's that's the first thing that everyone thinks about. They want to overclock. Well, what we found is there's actually quite a few operators who are interested in uh, underclocking, right? So I'm sure the 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 uh, Game of Thrones memes are, are are about to start ramping up pretty seriously about the having. Um, I'm I'm eager to see some Ned Stark having is coming. The ability to manage your opex is really what's going to determine who survives the months following the halving. Um, if if your power costs are out of control, there's a really good chance you're insolvent to pretty quickly after the halving. Now, hey man, if if Balaji's prediction comes true and where we're looking at a million dollar Bitcoin, that that's uh, that's out the window. But then you go to the other side, right? You go look at overclocking. If you can get more hash rate out of your machine, even if it ca- costs more power, like uh, you can make some severe profits that way um but either way the primary function that you get out of the firmware is control because uh the best analogy i think i've come up with is is basically 
is this. So like, if you imagine you've got a race car, you turn it on, there's one gear <laughs> and that's it. Like you've got neutral and, and fast. That's how the stock firmware works. Like you turn it on and that's it. You can go full speed and that that's all you got. Third party firmware gives you an accelerator pedal. <laughs> it gives you a heads up display. It gives you uh, live control and even in some cases, uh, auto tuning is what, what it's called. And basically what that is, is it's monitoring your power consumption. It's monitoring your, your clock speed on all the chips and it's using an algorithm to find the best setting for the chips or for the boards. So that's kind of like a smart operation. And then besides that, the, the overclocking, underclocking, the way that goes is basically you have preset profiles where like, um, ours list frequencies we're looking at uh, an improvement there to have like actual uh hash rates next to those frequencies but basically you could say here's your here's your default your nameplate speed here in the middle and then you can underclock by five percent you can underclock by uh ten percent or whatever or then you can go the other direction and overclock so add five ten twenty percent uh clock speed now all of those have have uh, trade-offs but what it does is it gives the, the operator the opportunity to make or not make those trade-offs how is this going to work with other middleware solutions out there? The first thing I'm thinking about is like maybe building into like Luxor pool itself. So if I log into my Luxor dashboard, am I going to be able to like control this remotely or even like other third party providers like Foreman? Is there things that like there's going to be like integrations in the future? So there's like a, a whole vertical of these, these tech stacks. Yeah. We're big fans of Foreman. Um, ultimately what it boils down to for the guys like Foreman is it's just API calls. So they have a, a REST API. We, we, built it out ourselves so like the rest api just allows foreman to say hey what's your clock speed hey what's your temperatures hey what right so that that's already there we support that um when it comes to uh, additional features that luxor provides like adjusting your voltage or frequency on the fly without a reboot or whatever like we'll need foreman to kind of help us out and, and build that out so for any of your listeners if you're foreman users make sure you start asking them to uh, build out that that support for our firmware as soon as they can we're out of the box okay with them. You can go monitor your 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 machines, but if you want to start overclocking or something like that in, in mass, uh, we'll need some support from them. I mean a little bit about the features that you guys are also uh, enabling with your your stock your software stack. I've already seen some screenshots and cool things online, like the ability to reboot an individual hashboard, to control an individual hashboard. I saw another thing the other day talking about how uh, you guys can also enable the miner to redirect the hash to two different accounts at the same time, which you're not able to do with just like the stock firmware, uh, which like just as a, a side here, it's kind of a cool thing because like I can pay myself and maybe if I want to sell some hash rate onto nice hash or I want to send it to someone else, I'd be able to do that or send hash rate to two different addresses, things like that. Yeah, I honestly, I think the coolest application of that hash rate splitting is like pleb miners. Like, hey man, I don't want to spend $3,000 on a machine, but I could stomach 1500 hey, friend, you've got a really killer power price. Uh, let's get together. So you go put those two guys together and they have the, they buy one miner or they can buy two or whatever. But like now the individual miner performance doesn't matter. You don't have to worry about, well, hey, man, this miner's down or this miner's like, no, no, no. If one miner's down, you don't have to worry about that. You can split the cost and everything's good. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really neat feature in that you can point it. You don't need to have like, limitations by the pool you can even technically use two different pools so it gives a lot of flexibility to users and how they want to do it and i, I tried to coin the term on twitter micro hosting um but uh i mean that, that's effectively what it is it's uh yeah micro hosting yeah you gotta keep pushing that maybe you'll get some traction <laughs> i like that though yeah so like the idea from that from my understanding is the fact that you guys are enabling um the dev fee that you guys already pull from the hash rate here and then splitting it off as like a product that you're pushing on to the users of it. Tell me a little about that, like how you guys get paid. Uh, it seems to be like you guys get you guys get a little bit of hash rate for anyone who's using this software. Yeah, so um, dev fee is kind of like an extension of the hash rate splitting, basically, or you could do that in reverse. Hash rate splitting is an extension of the dev fee. So like having the capacity to um, redirect shares to a different pool is something we kind of started foundationally. Like that's hard coded into the the source code to um with the ability to redirect shares to different pools you can have variable inputs like hey i have two different pools i want to split my hash rate with my buddy 
And then we also have the ability to direct a specific amount of hash rate directly to Luxor pool. And that's our, our primary model for income. Our base dev fee, it, it's a developer fee. I think it comes from like the earlier days when people were doing this for, for kicks, but didn't want to do it for free. Um, so they would redirect some hash rate and there were developers doing it, right? So dev fee, our dev fee is 2.8% out of the box. Um, we believe that's, that's competitive with, uh, the rest of the market. And then, um, the kicker is if you use Luxor pool, we'll reduce your, your pool fees. So, um, you're paying 2.8% and, um, you get the way we administer it is you get a rebate on at the end of the month. So like we, you've contributed your hash rate for the month. Okay. We give you the, the Bitcoin back for that. Gotcha. All right. Let's talk about what's minor. We have to bring that up. So <laughs> obviously there's a lot of different miners out there. Um, K and N what's minor, um, stuff like that. How are you guys going to approach the next beast? Just moving past the ant miner. So I think you have to look at market share for those models. That's ultimately what it boils down to. Um, I think a lot of people underestimate how massive ant miner is, how big of a head start they had before they had that split and what's minor kind of started up. Right. Um, it's not to say that we'll, we'll never support what's minor, but we have a really full and robust roadmap, just trying to get support for the, the majority of the, the modern ant miner fleet. We know that a lot of the, a lot of the off raid guys are, are the disciples of Steve Barber, if you will, uh, they love to come and uh, troll me about when what's minor. And all I can say is. I'm not sure yet, but uh, Ant Miner oh, no. first, and and we'll go we'll go from there. But if I had a sat for every uh every time I've heard when what's minor, I'd I'm not saying I'd be a whole coiner, but damn near it. When I have to be on the show, you'd be retired somewhere. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it's interesting to see that continue to be a debate is or a thing I should say, not really a debate. So you're saying here it's because of the market, just not necessarily like a push right now. Like there's enough business for the Ant Miners to keep going there. Is it, does that have anything to do with like how difficult it is to work with the micro BT backend? Like, is it, is it harder or simpler, uh, to, to work with that and develop some sort of firmware for it? I can't speak directly to that because I haven't even gotten my hands on it. Um, I'm not sure if we've even put what's minor in the hands of our engineering team. Um, the pace that they've done this stuff, like just since I've gotten here, like the, the, with how quickly they respond, like I'd be surprised if our guys couldn't, um, get into it. Um, but I can speak to one of the factors that may affect it or influence how difficult it is, is uh, variability in like supply chain. So like when we started this whole project off, one of the, the big topics of discussion for us and one of the critical points for us to innovate here, um, when we started off, everything was shipping from Antminer with, um, with an, a Xilinx control board, right? So it's the one with the micro SD slot on the back, not a micro USB and not the blank plate with the US or the SD underneath, right? Xilinx is what we support, right? That is because when when we kicked this off a year and a half, two two years ago, everyone was using everything was coming with Xilinx. So we make that business decision, and then like a year and a half later, we come out to go beta test, and everyone's like, "Beekleba and Logic, what do you got, man?" And I'm like, yeah. "We'll send you some control boards." So uh, let me uh, let me actually use this to shill. Uh, we're doing a giveaway, so um, oh, nice. go check out our Twitter page. We're giving away four four control boards. Uh, I don't know what our time frame is, but we're giving out four control boards with one of our partners, Altair Tech, a US-based uh, uh, mining supplier. He's got some really good stuff. And then we've got another guy we'll be pairing with, uh, James from Advanced Crypto Systems, I believe, down in Fort Worth, who's uh, helping us out with some control boards. They're partners who've been testing with us for some time now. But um, yeah, go check out our Twitter. We've got a, a giveaway. There's ways to enter. So if you're a home miner, you've got an S19 J Pro or an XP, and you want to try out our firmware, but but you don't have a, a Xylem control board, go uh, follow the rules and jump in the submissions and we'll uh, we'll see if we can't get you one. Love that. Now, just like a personal anecdote with the whole thing. I mean, I tried to put brains on my two S19s and then when I finally got everything ready to go, I like, had my S19s and I had, like downloaded the firmware and was like ready to put it in. I realized I had the wrong control board and then I was like, oh shoot. So then I had to like go find them and then I finally got one of the correct control boards and then for whatever reason, it like wouldn't load correctly. And so it just like, it didn't matter at all. Um, yep. But it's it's quite a journey and like there's so many missing parts and like it, there's so much knowledge you need to gather often just in like weird telegram groups to be able to understand like <laughs> yeah. what you need to do just to, to, to overhash or overclock or whatnot. Um, yeah, there's definitely some missing knowledge there, but that's, that's funny you bring that up. And for anyone listening, 
be sure to learn a little bit about control boards before you start wading into this territory. Yep. Um, let's talk two more things before we close out here. One, I want to talk about business development for this product. And then second, I want to talk about problems with the ant miners. Um, if if you've come across with any of those, or if your team has been uh, talking about them, I, and I've talked with Nick, uh, CEO of Luxor, a little bit about problems with the SITXP and overclocking it. Um, we'll get to that in a second. Tell me a bit about the business development with this product. Who are you guys going after mainly to onboard? Who do you think this was appropriate for? Uh, where are you excited to see this launch? Anyone can use this. Like just to be fully honest like at some point we've got an s9 image we're going to release it at some point we're just really strapped for for bandwidth as far as supporting it like we don't want to release it and then have our tech team just flooded with support tickets and then not be able to respond to those because we want to be able to support it as it's as it's coming through um but like if you're a, a home miner and you want to tinker with the whole space heater concept like you could do that very easily with an s9 in our firmware like it you can adjust your fan speeds your 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 uh clock speed anything you need you can adjust your your heat output so with a little raspi or something like that you could make a killer little space heater um and then on the other side of this um pubco obviously like the, the big guys we're, we're trying to target them um we're excited to to get this in front of them because we do think it will provide them a huge amount of flexibility like if you look at um some of the uh curtailment applications right now the way most people do curtailment is with just on off like hey shut down miner <laughs> like all of that thermal cycling isn't good for the silicon in the, in the long run. So like if you can imagine where like they get direct, let's say it's controllable load response. If they get a command to, to reduce their, their consumption, like you can say, okay, dial it down by 25%, dial it down by 50%. Like we mm-hmm. can support that with a much more gradual, uh, uh, decrease in consumption and reduce the risk to the, to the machine in that way. And then like you can get really crazy with like fan response. Like you can say like, hey, come down on temperature or come down on clock speed, but don't try to cool it in the meantime, like turn the fan off to where you stay hot because we know we're about to come up again. We don't want to thermal cycle it on on the way back mm-hmm. up. So like, you can get really creative in different ways that you utilize this, um, especially in some of, like I said, the the deregulated grids where they have that curtailment option. That's one of the, the functions that I'm really excited. We don't have it yet, but we've got a really cool outline on how it's going to how it's going to look. Um, so yeah, the, the business development's been exciting. It's it's um, it's challenging at times with the the control board thing because like if we had the BeagleBone support, if we had the remote install like that, like you'd be like, here you go, let's yeah. do it. And then and then I could just pester people. But like I've been making trips out to West Texas, out to to Illinois, just doing different things to to get control boards into people's hands and like actually hands on trying to help people swap their control boards to to get the the test rigs up because. Uh, we weren't going to go public without having adequate testing, right? So we've got we've got a hundred machines of our own self mining uh, S nineteen J pros uh, at two different locations that are up and running. So we've got I think about fifteen petahash that we've used to test this uh, before we went public with it. Nice. No, I, I like those marginal efficiencies, uh, and sometimes people just like don't really think about them. But at the end of the day, that just means more Bitcoin in your pocket. So if you're able to like increase them, like the, the thermal cycling is one thing that a lot of people don't talk about, right? Like the fact that I want to keep my machines high so there's less breakage in the machine over time, less wear and tear really is the phrase I should use over time just mm-hmm. because I'm controlling the life cycle of the miner from, from end to end with firmware. Okay, last topic. I uh, want to touch on this and it's not really like in your zone as far as I understand it, but I'm curious to know what you know about it and that's ant miner problems or anything you've seen. Um, we've been doing some investigation. I wrote a piece about this a few weeks ago. Uh, I'm assuming that you guys have been looking into this as well since your engineers and mechanics have been tearing these things apart, looking at the insides of XPs and other S19 models. Yeah. So like when I saw your article, I read through it and I went and talked to our engineer about it, like just to kind of make sure I understood it properly, make sure that I talked about it with a, a sense of being informed. But, um, so one of the things that is the first one that comes up is the pick, right? Like everyone talks about oh, the, pick, the pick. We've encountered multiple models of JPro and XP that do and don't have picks. Um, we don't have any trouble with our firmware being able to control individual hash boards. Just we don't. There's a separate pin, I believe, on the ribbon cable that allows you to to pull down the the uh, the board. There's a lot of different intricacies in the different hash board models, but the long and short of it is the pick doesn't 
lock our firmware into going down if one of the hash boards goes down. So you can keep running. That's one of our, our key features in that like, hey, if you're over temp, if you hit over temp on one board, you keep hashing on the other two, it'll try to reboot the the uh, hot board up to three times. And if it doesn't get the temperature under control, it'll leave that board down and you can come back in, reboot that board. And if, let's say, um, let's say it's still really hot outside and you think you won't get the temperature down, you could actually reduce the clock speed on that board to keep it at least hashing, maybe not at, at top, uh, top hash rate. So that's on the topic of the pick. Um, on the topic of the aluminum backing, um, the concern there I think is a little, it's not overstated. It's just, I think it's more unknown. So like the first thing that comes to mind, my background is a mechanical engineer. Um, from a heat transfer perspective, aluminum is a great, great conductor of heat. It'll, it'll get rid of heat. So like if there's a concern, it, from my perspective, it might be that you can cool too quickly or that you have a dissimilar material contributing to uh, stresses uh, as it cools. I think that one's a little bit inconclusive as to whether or not it's it's going to contribute to more or less failures. That's more or less my take on, on the topic at this point. Do you have any thoughts or have you heard any, anything else like that? Yeah, no, that's some of the feedback I've gotten as well. Um, which we're planning on doing like a follow-up podcast with with a few people on it, but I've been delayed in getting to it. But we rest assured we'll get to it at some point. Um, some things that I've talked with Nick about for your guys' research specifically was like the difficulties in overclocking or underclocking in XP. And I'm wondering if there's if you have any commentary on that or know anything about that. And then uh, any other like S19 models that when you guys were doing this tear down with your Lux OS software, if you guys found anything. Give me one second. I might be able to get Nick in here. He just uh, he just got back to me. Uh, we'll see if that works out. But either way, like I can say a little bit about overclocking XP. So like, yeah, I'm sure I know everyone's kind of seen his tweets about the uh, um, about the 200 terahash. Like that was very early on in some of our yeah. testing. We only had one profile, and Nick was like, "Let's just let it rip and see how 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 hot we can get it." He's uh he's up in Seattle. I'm I don't think I'm doxing him. I think he's he said that before. But uh, yeah, an open garage door. It was pretty cool, and he was able to take it pretty pretty high. Um, but there are some um, I don't know how to describe it besides like software challenges with like actually feeding the chips appropriately. I believe so. Like you end up getting some st- stale or um, uh, duplicate uh, hashes submitted, and so it may not be as easy to go up to that kind of clock speed with, with the XP. Um, I have heard of some, um, some difficulties, especially overclocking, um, even in immersion settings where you've got pretty well controlled cooling, but it's still relatively early in the the life cycle of the XP. So I wouldn't speak too much on it. I mean, I can say that I did underclock an XP down to 90 terahash per second and got like 19 and a half, uh, joules per terahash, which was pretty awesome. Nice. Yeah, some efficiency right there. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I think there's going to be more information. Like every day, I kind of hear more things about like problems with ant miners. Um, so yeah, definitely, it's definitely something to keep an eye on. I think firmware solutions are definitely going to be important in keeping these machines operating because they are pretty expensive computers at the end of the day, right? Pretty expensive. And that's one thing I can shout out on our firmware is all of our logs are like custom built. So like they're enormous. Like our, our our engineering team is like all about the logs and like I think it's like a hundred megabytes every two hours. So like anything that happens in the machine, like you can go and pinpoint exactly. So like as soon as you get it up and running, you can isolate. Like it it could be burdensome, burdensome, but like if we work with uh, with our customers, I think we can develop some really cool like log filtering tools and stuff like that to get the most out of it. To where when something does go wrong, we can isolate and understand it and potentially develop a solution or just get it repaired yeah yeah no there's definitely like a, a growing uh cadre i'd say of different firmware solutions out there and it's going to be cool when they like all work together and we can just keep our machines online uh, optimally and earn more bitcoin so that's the dream yeah. right absolutely <laughs> thank you so much for joining the podcast today uh where can we find you uh the twitterverse or telegram or somewhere else yeah so i'm on twitter at tdrm lusto the Daily Reveille, the t- the for first few letters, I wrote opinion columns for for the uh, school newspaper at LSU. So, 
uh, TDR underscore M Lusto. And uh, on Telegram, I think I'm just at Matt underscore Lusto. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, otherwise, yeah, thanks for having me, Will. I really appreciate coming on. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I'll speak again with you soon. Everyone who's listening to this, uh, be sure to give us a like and subscribe. Also, go check out Luxor Technologies. Go check out their awesome newsletter as well, Hash Rate Index. Okay, we'll see you guys later. Bye.